Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Martin. I'm one of the two programmers of uh, Pop Culture, and um, I think most of you saw me yesterday as well. This is um, this is John Savage. Um, John is well. John does many things. I first came across his name um, on a pet shop. I saw. I bought a Pet Shop Boys record called Alternative. That was in 1995. And it was a collection of B-sides. I don't know if you know what a B-side is. A B-side is is the song on the other side of a single. Um, I don't know if you know what a single is. A single is a single song, um, unlike an album, which is a collection of many songs. Um, and John is friends with Pet Shop Boys, and he did an introduction to all those B-sides. And he also did an interview with him. And after that, I bought his books. There's a very famous one called England's Dreaming, which is about punk, which I can highly recommend. And there's another great one called Teenage, which is about teenagers and how the term was, you say, coined? Coined? Um, about young people and uh, what, how young people have become an industry that you can sell stuff to. And... Um, and his new book is called 1966, and he's written about a specific year, which is 1966, um, which uh, John finds quite um, interesting. He didn't uh, write about it. He didn't write about 1971. He wrote about 1966. I can, yeah, I can re recommend, I can, well, read all of his books. I think they're easy to read. They're quite long and very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm I'm wondering whether can we maybe have another microphone? Would that be okay? Ah, there it is. So um please Hello. give a warm welcome to John Savage. You're very good to come this early in the morning. It's far too early for me. But we got we managed to get a, a tea for John on the way. Because without tea, an Englishman can't survive. Uh, I'm part Irish. All right. Actually, John is applying for... I'm applying for Irish passport because I wanted to stay in Europe. <laughs> I'm so angry about it and I'm so ashamed. Would you... Would you I'm happy to I talk about it. I'm going to live in Ireland, thank you. But okay. I'm going to have an Irish passport so I can move around the EU. Thank you very much. I don't want to stick. I live in Wales, which is very, very different from England anyway. Wales, unfortunately, voted to leave in an act of economic suicide because the whole country is propped up by EU funding. So the whole thing is beyond rationality. And imagine living in a country that is behaving beyond rationality. Sorry, that's my political statement this morning, or one of them anyway. <laughs> And it's very nice to be in Europe. How civilized. <laughs> Although you wonder when you walk down Karl Marx Straße if this is... Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, basically, I just I, I want to talk to John um, about how he grew up and how he became what he is now. How, <laughs> how, he be how he became what he is now. Is that correct English? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and these people here are, let's say, between the ages of 18 and uh, 35 or something. So, and John will be, am I allowed to say it? 63 tomorrow. So, and I think, um, and he doesn't, he doesn't look like it, I think. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Virgo, like him. Yes, we're both Virgos. Um, so, and it was my birthday last week. Oh. Aww. How old were you, Martin? Um, uh, 41. Uh, does he look it, everyone? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, um, well, you grew up in a quite exciting time in London um, because there was a music, suddenly there was a music called punk, oh. um, which, shall we, or is that too late to no, start? Fine. But it, uh, I mean, when punk happened, I was 23, 24. So I had... But there was music before... You had yeah, I mean, been, yeah. you know, you're, you're all too young to this, but I was, basi I was born in 1953, so it was eight years after the war. When I was born in the UK, don't know what was happening here in Germany, but they were still rationing. 
um, until I was an, a young adult. During the punk period, um, I worked in the city of London, the financial centre, and there were bomb sites everywhere. So the point of that is that the Second World War was still very, very present when I was being, you know, when I was young. Um, and in many ways, my generation, who were born <coughs> some years after the war, but near enough to the war, our job was to start undoing the damage of the war and to examine the psychology of what had happened during the war, particularly in Britain. Um, and in Britain, there wasn't the examination you had in Germany because, of course, we'd won. But in fact, obviously, in many ways, Britain had lost, particularly, you know, the real winner of the war was America. And that was what I wrote about at the end of my book, Teenage, was 1945. The book Teenage ends in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, the atom bomb, and the ascension of America to being a world power. And the whole point of the book Teenage was to actually begin in the 19th century and then to end at the point where the teenager is invented. And the teenager is a particular um, is a particular vision and definition of social definition of youth, which has to do with number one consumerism, which is very American, and number two, an idea of democracy, democracy through participation in consumerism, with also some democratic ideals, and that's the vision of youth which we in the West have had during the last seventy years. So that was the point of the book. Anyway, that's not quite answering your question, Martin. No, still, st <laughs> still interesting. Um, but, but yeah, I, w I mean, it's... So the, yeah, the music you listened to when, uh, let's say, when you were 10, that's 1963. Well, 1963 was the year that the Beatles happened. And I know you hear people my age going on about the Beatles all the time, but they really were wonderful, and they really did change everything. In the UK, it was a revolution, um, and it was brought about through popular music, and it was a generational revolution. And so when I was nine, I first heard the Beatles. And then I was a pop fan from then. Well, I was a pop fan before. The first record I bought was by Del Shannon. Does anybody know who Del Shannon is? Oh, oh somebody does. <laughs> He rules. It was called Little Town Flirt. <laughs> Check it on YouTube. It's really good. <laughs> But yes, so... I was fortunate enough to see, um, there were two weekly television programs in the UK, Ready, Set, Go, and Top of Pops, and you could see pop music, and there were pop magazines everywhere, and it was a very exciting time. And of course, I couldn't intellectualize it, I was only 10, um, but it was the only thing in the world that made sense to me, because I lived in the suburbs of London, the whole point about the suburbs. Did any of you grow up in the suburbs? So it's an ideal environment, it's safe, is kind of boring. It's a nice place to grow up, but it's boring. And the only thing that made sense to me that was mine, was nothing to do with the war or anything like that, was pop music. And the big change in British society, which happened the year before 1966 and 1965, was when Winston Churchill died. And there was a huge state funeral in early 1965. And that was the end of Victorian 19th century Britain. And suddenly, the new Britain came up. And did you have um, friends with, with, um, with who you, I don't know, exchanged records or well, talked about pop music? How many here of you are obsessed with music? Most of you, right. But you also know that there are a lot of people who aren't. Most people are not particularly interested in music. They'll buy, you know, the latest record. They'll buy the record by Adele. Why, I don't know, because it's shit. But, well, honestly, I heard it on the radio. I heard this song on the radio, and it's stupid lyric, ridiculous, over-emoting, and like, Ooh, you know that stuff they do now. And I said to my friends, this is absolute garbage. Who is it? And they said, you can't say that, it's Adele. And I said, I certainly can say it, because it's crap. Honestly, I hated it before I even knew who, who, who she was. So most people don't like music. So, and it's only a small proportion of people who really do. And so obviously you find the person who is obsessed with music. I found, I had friends when I was 11, 12 who were obsessed with music. I was obsessed with Bob Dylan and the Yardbirds. And we used to sing songs on the top of the bus going to school like everybody else does. Um, but that was, I suppose, the way I defined myself. But I think music is such a wonderful form of communication. Um, because it hits the body and it hits the head and it hits the emotions all at the same time. It's physical, 
but it's also spiritual and it's also psychological and it's also physiological. And I can't see why people wouldn't be obsessed by it, but of course many people aren't. And what about clothes? Did music also inform the way you dress? <laughs> well, uh, I'm an only child and it was the 60s and so I had to dress how my parents wanted and there was a terrible battle for a long, long, long time. And the battle when I was growing up was about the length of hair, okay? Could you have it over your ears? Could you have it down to your cock? This went on for years, okay? Um, and it was really, really boring. Um, and now my, mo my mother's still alive. Recently, she said, because I now have it cut quite short, she said, can you have it a bit longer? Because she thinks it looks a bit it's, it's gay. It's never right. Yeah, yeah, she thinks it looks a bit gay. Can you have it a bit longer? And I said, mother, when I was a teenager, you wanted me to have it shorter, and now you want me to have it longer. What do you want? It's, it's very difficult. <laughs> so I've got the same conversations in, well, there in, you go, in suburban just, Hamburg. Yeah, there you go. It's, um, th this is what's great, because this stuff translates over different countries and into different times. It's the same kind of thing, but with different props and different sounds. But it's always a struggle. And my parents were very, very conservative. They couldn't, um, so I had to do everything in secret. Um, and being a Virgo, I'm very good at being secret. And quite good at being sly sometimes when you have to be. Because, of course, then I started taking drugs. <laughs> 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 Because all the groups I liked were taking drugs, and they were singing about taking drugs. So why wouldn't I take drugs? Sure, I can only, only the psychedelics, n nothing. I never like pills or powders, and I don't recommend anybody take anything, by the way. But we spoke about this actually on the way to... Because he said, he's, Martin asked me, why did you become the way you have become? And there were two things that happened. One was before I started taking drugs, which is seeing, and I write about it in my new book. When I was 15, I saw, um, I was rebellious, and I still am, but I saw uh, a film they showed at school, a film called The War Game, which is a film by the British um, director called Peter Watkins, And it's a simulation, a drama, a simulation of what would happen if a one megaton H-bomb fell on a small British town. And it's the most horrifying thing I've ever seen. I had to watch it to look at my new, to research it for my new book. And I could only, I was on the sofa watching it like that. And I could only watch five minutes at a time because I was so upset by it. And it has people, you know, melting eyeballs and screaming and all terrible, terrible things. And I came out of that showing, I was 15, and I thought, if this can happen in the world, then everything I've been taught is wrong. Have you, has any of you ever had anything like that, where you just realize that a lot of what you've been taught by your parents and the values of the world are all wrong? Yeah? Okay, so it was that moment, um, and that's what triggered it. And then, and I thought, I had nightmares about it for months afterwards, and I thought, right, that's it. If I'm going to be blown up tomorrow, I'm going to do what I want. Not what school tells me, not what my parents tell me, not what church tells me. They can all piss off. I'm going to do what I want. And, of course, to actually get there took years and years and years and years and years and years and years and, years and a lot of determination and a lot of luck. And luck, I think... <coughs> Timing is probably the most important thing in life. You see an opportunity, you have to go for it. Um, it's the and you have to have the courage to go for it. That's the most important thing. Um, and you have to know and you have to go with it, even though it might be difficult. And it's the same in love affairs and it's the same in life. So um, the next thing that happened to me, there were three things that happened to me. The next thing that happened to me was taking LSD, um, which again, I don't recommend, but I really, really liked. Um, and um, that just totally changed everything. Um, so that was when I was 18. And then the third thing, I only took LSD for about two years. And it was very interesting. Um, and I always made sure that I left a lot of time between each, each experience because it's very, very strong. And the whole point about LSD is that, every, you know, right now we're only using a small part of our brain, and we're actually focused to get through the day, to do what we have to do. We're focused on various things. We're, we're like that, like that. Whereas with LSD, everything comes in on you at once. So you have enormous amount of visual and sensory stimuli, and it's incredibly exhausting. Um, and so um, I did an interview once with Ray Manzarek of The Doors, 
um, before he died. And I, we talked about LSD, and I said, oh, you know, because I thought he'd have taken it 100 times. And he said, how many times did you take it? And he said, oh, about 20. And I said, oh, so did I. That was how many times I took it. He said, that's enough. You've learned all you need to know by that time. And, of course, some people take it and have a terrible time, which is why I do not recommend it. However, that was the time, 1970, 71, 72, that was what was happening. Um, and the third thing was, when I was 23 in 1976, I was studying to be a lawyer, um, a solicitor in the UK, which is not the one that goes to court. It's the one that's in the background doing all the work. And I absolutely hated it. Um, it was the last phase of my struggle with my parents. That's what they wanted me to do, and I hated it. And so I remember studying for these exams and thinking, what the hell am I doing? And I went out for a long walk in the summer. It's very hot. It's like it was today. And I thought, if you're so clever, what do you want to do if you don't want to do this? You know, it's okay hating this, but what are you going to do? And I thought to myself, I'm going to be a writer. And it just came to me. It was an instinctive decision. It wasn't thought out. It was just, this is what I'm going to do. Um, and so, if you like, it was a moment of revelation. And then within three months of having that thought, or four months, I'd started to write. I did a fanzine. And through doing that fanzine in punk in December 1976, after seeing Sex Pistols and Clash, um, I got a job on, a freelance job, on one of the major British music publications called Sounds. And then I was off. That was it. I was working. Could you um, quickly tell us about the fanzine? Because I'm not <coughs> too sure whether everyone here knows what it is. I mean, these days, I think you could say zines have been replaced by blogs, of course, maybe. Of course. But could you quickly, because, I mean, we had this, we did an interview a while ago. Uh, we talked about this. I still find it quite interesting. Um, these limited edition, let's call them newspapers. Uh, do any magazines? of you have any conception of what punk fanzines were like? Okay, well, not many. Okay, so what it is very, very simple. A4 sheet of paper, standard, sh standard printing sheet of paper, um, 10 or 12 pages, uh, Xerox, so you do designs, you write on it, you, you fill out 10 to 12 blank pages, you either type, you put montages on, you put bits on, um, and then you photocopy them, which is why it's a limited edition. And then you staple them together, and then you take them to, in, in, the, in London in the punk days, there were a couple of shops that sold them, um, record shop, bookshop, you take it down there, you tell the person to sell them for 40 pence or 30 pence. <coughs> and, um, and in the UK during 1977, there were, there were dozens of them. And it was a wonderful way for young people to actually start communicating there were no rules, you could do exactly what you want. Some people just made them more visuals, some people tried to be like uh, the music press. There was one which I helped to get photocopied, which was done <coughs> by Shane McGowan of the Pogues, and it was called Bondage, and he'd put safety pins and razor blades all over it. And I helped him to photocopy it, and it was really dangerous on the Xerox machine with all these razors on this bit of paper. But that's what people used to do, and that was the currency then. But it's so different now, it's completely different now, um, because compared to 40 years ago, there is so much now. There's almost too much, whereas in the punk period, one of the reasons it was successful was that there was so little. And so it was possible to have that laser-like focus because of that scarcity. Now there's almost too much. I don't know whether you agree, but I, I find it, it was easy to make an impact then if you're in the right t time in the right place. It's much harder now. Um, and there is also something, I like physicality. I like physical things. I don't like stocks and shares. I don't particularly, you know, I like things to be physical and material. And there's something about the materiality of print that I really, really like and has a kind of authority that... I don't find on the net, but also I'm old. I mean, I use, I'm, I am completely computer and net literate, but I still, I'm still old school and I like paper because there's something there. On the internet, I don't know whether you agree, and this is an interesting discussion. I'm not saying I'm right at all, but there's so much there. How do you evel evaluate what is good, what is, has quality, what is good for you in all, in all the stuff? And obviously we do, and we navigate the internet, but I think it's very hard to make an impact. You're just one of hundreds of thousands, millions maybe. 
Is that right? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and um, yeah, but then at the same time, I'm thinking, is there any ad advice one can give? And my next thought was, maybe there really isn't because you, it's really, I mean, timing is, I can only repeat what you said, timing is important. Uh, I don't know if you can force such, if you can force such a moment when you were 23 and you decided to become a writer. I don't know if you can, <coughs> I don't know, get, uh, force yourself to, be to come into a position where suddenly such a revelation comes. Can you force a revelation? Well, if you have a revelation, it was only under extreme pressure. I mean, I was, you know, I was doing something I really, 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 really hated. So, um, if you're doing something you really hate, <laughs> that could give you a positive. Um, you're thinking, well, what am I going to do? If I if I don't do something else, I'm going to have to do this. Um, it's very hard to, I mean, it's very hard to give it. I suppose the only advice I can give is if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. And if you're going to do it, then just do it. It's very yeah, simple, no, you're actually. Right. Um, it's as simple as that. And only you know whether you're going to do it. And Could then you? you have to have a bit of luck. And then the one thing I would say to people, to younger people, is make sure, I'm sorry to swear, fucking make sure you get paid. You should not work for no money. This drives me completely mental. Okay, in our society, in capitalism, value is conferred through money. If you are not being paid, that means that people do not value you. It's very, very basic. And even now, I get people asking me to do stuff for no money. BBC called me up recently. Oh, we're doing a television program on this novel. We'd love you to talk. Man, man, man. Ten minutes on the phone. Yeah, I can talk about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Me. By the way, am I? Do you, you know, you, you're paying me a fee, aren't you? Oh well, no. I'm sorry. Me, oh, you just wasted my time for 10 minutes. You're getting paid, the cameraman's getting paid, the presenter's getting paid. Why am I not getting paid when I'm giving you content? If you create content and give content, you should be paid. And, don't, and do not accept it. Always ask, even if it's a token payment. I, still, I do lots of different things. And sometimes if I know the people don't have any money, or much money, I say, you can give me 500, plus 100 pounds. It's just the principle of the matter, that you have to be, I can't insist on this enough. I hate the way that the new media economy and the third, the third technological revolution has taken money away from the people who actually do the work um, and actually provide content. I really, really hate it. Yes. Um, no, I can. I well, totally I do agree. agree. No, you're yeah, absolutely so, right. It's so insulting. No, I get annoyed at this as well. I mean, but you know, we and this is the whole way that our society is going. We're moving towards a plutocracy, a particular hideous kind of oligarchy, and even small acts of resistance. You know, which we all have to do at various points. Um, you know, we have to fight that because otherwise we'll just get screwed into the ground. And I'm just in the same position as the rest of you because I'm completely freelance. I have no contract with anybody. I have to earn all my money on a piece-by-piece -piece basis. And so I've learned to be extremely tough about it. And I'm very fortunate in that because I'm older, I have a reputation, people want me for various things, and I insist on being paid. And it's often a real wrangle. And I just say, if, you don't want, if you're not going to pay me, you can fuck off. That's, that I, um, well, I'm in the same position, and I can only agree. And it's re that was really some really good. Um, advice, I think. And the other good advice that I can maybe give you, also looking at uh, John's life, is uh, I always think it's good if you don't, um, if you have many, if you try to create many opportunities for you to express yourself. Yes, yes. To not only because what yes, I like yes. about John's work is well, I first saw him where his name in a record, inside a record, and then I opened the booklet, and there he was, because he did an interview and a short introduction. Then I read a book about him. Then he also compiles CDs. Yes. Then I've never, sadly, I've never seen a TV program by yours, but John also... I make films, TV make, films. Yeah. ...makes films. Um, and th it's always good to not, not having to rely on just one thing. 
Uh, but I think we're all getting used to this, aren't we? I mean, I, I just think if you're going to work for yourself in the creative field, whatever you do, you have to be a bit of a hustler and you have to be a bit of an opportunist. And I'm a hustler and I'm an opportunist just like everybody else. You know, I'm not saying I'm superior in that way. I hustle. I'm an opportunist. If not, the opportunist comes, I'll grab it. And I'll also, if somebody offers me an opportunity to do something I haven't done before, I'll do it because it's interesting. Maybe you can learn something. Maybe you can find another way. I do about five or six different things. I work on exhibitions. I make TV films, compile CDs. Occasionally, I do bits of journalism, write books. I do lots of different things because it keeps me interested. That's the main thing. It keeps my mind active, uh, which, it, as you get older, is very important, Martin. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and so it's very important, to, I think, to diversify. And also, the different areas that I work in kind of feed into each other or inform each other. And, and I have to say that the big change recently, in the last 10 years, is in journalism. I used to really like, I used to work for a newspaper called The Guardian and The Observer. Um, and to me, journalism in the UK, I don't know whether any of you are, are journalists or newspaper journalists or have ambitions to be so, but it's just completely dissolved. It's just gone. Um, and in the UK, I don't know what it's like in Germany, most of the press is very, very right-wing. And I will not work for right-wing newspapers. I just will not do it. I had a big argument with somebody recently, and they, I was complaining about The Guardian because they don't pay anything. And, you know, they've got financial problems. And they said, well, why don't you work for The Daily Telegraph? And I said, I don't work for right-wing newspapers. And he said, oh, well, that's very fastidious. I said, I don't care what you think. I'm not doing it. And that's that. Because I hate those bastards. And rightfully so. I'm still, I'm 63. Yeah. I shouldn't be thinking like this, but I do. Yeah. I can't good. stand them. You know, I'm interested in what happens next. I'm interested in you guys, because you're going to inherit the world. You're going to be making the changes. And that's what I want to see. There's still lots of changes that need to be made. Enormous amount of changes. You know, I'm living in, I'm living in a country where nobody is saying one word about the most serious challenge that we face in the world, which is climate change. Nobody is saying one fucking word about it. I'm furious. Yeah, you're right. You know, and you are the guys, you, I mean, I'll, I'll be dead within, you know, however many years, but you are going to be the ones that are going to have to deal with it, and you are going to be have to... Want. All of this has to change. Not everything has to change, but unless the changes are made, I feel so strongly about this, we are going to descend into barbarism and war and a few, you know, warlords, you know, in the next 50 years, unless people actually stand up and say, we want to change what needs to be changed, and we want to keep what is good about our current society, because there's an enormous amount about our current society that is good, the freedoms that we have. It's incredibly important. If you think about the freedoms that we have, compared to 50 years ago, it's incredible. Everybody goes on about the 60s all the time, but in the 60s, the music was wonderful, but we didn't have the freedoms we have now. You know, in, in England, I don't know what it's like in Germany, homosexuality was illegal until 1967. Abortion was illegal. There were no equal rights for women. You know, all of this stuff has happened during the last 50 years, largely as a result of teenage culture and pop culture, which is very much, and the point of me doing the book about 66 was that was a moment when the pop culture was reflecting civil rights, movement in America, which 1966 was a fantastic year for civil rights. I mean, extraordinary, not a fantastic, but a really, really powerful year because that was the start of black power, the start of the second wave of feminism, the start of the gay movement, the start of a lot of freedoms in general. And I don't want to lose those freedoms, but I think that we are in danger of losing those freedoms unless we all say, right, that's enough, we're going to do something about it. And even small acts of resistance, even small acts of resistance, like insisting on getting paid, you know, you just got to stop it all, because otherwise, I'm afraid I don't feel very good about the future. I, I don't know what you guys feel, but it's, to me it's very, very serious. We're at a very, very serious moment, because I can see the, the extreme right wing getting more and more powerful. It's just happened in the UK, we've just had a right wing coup. You know, and it hasn't really started to bite yet, and it is in um, the economic and political sphere, but it could easily be in the social sphere. 
and all the freedoms that my generation has, has fought for. And everybody goes on about baby boomers in the UK and how terrible it is they're taking it. You know, a lot of us fought for the freedoms that we have today. Is there... <laughs> <laughs> Um, John needs to catch a train later because he's going to Düsseldorf where he'll be opening an exhibition tomorrow. Um, just to remind you, tomorrow is his birthday. Um, so it's 10.39 <laughs> now. So I would say there's, and also they need to go to their workshops, I would say there's time for one last question uh, by me. You have a couple, Tom. Oh, no. Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Do you want any questions from the audience? Ah, yeah. Or, or would you like no, to ask one questions? One last question and questions from you guys. When go on, my only, well, my only last question would be is if there's any, is there, like in hard times, is there, is, the, is there advice you could give when you, I don't know, think maybe your writing is crap, when no one, when the BBC doesn't call you, um, when, I don't know, when you're stuck? Is there, or, or do you never have these? Oh yeah, of course, everybody does. Um, what I do is that I you take a walk. You often I walk. I take a walk, but I get very pissed off with everybody, and I just think, right, that's it. Nobody's going to change me. That's it. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> that's <laughs> called obstinacy. Okay. In the. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Yes. But everybody, everybody has it. Everybody has the down moments. I mean, I'm incredibly fortunate. I'm having probably the best career time of my life, and I'm 63. It's taken until now, you know, which is a long, long time. Um, so, you know, and I, I'm still very, very lucky um, because a lot of people work very hard, and they don't get any attention at all. So you have to. And I'm incredibly appreciative of it. You have to count your blessings. There's nothing worse than getting to my age and feeling bitter. You have to appreciate what you have and not think about what you don't have. Our consumer society always insists on us thinking about what we don't have. But to think about what you do have and appreciate it is a really good thing to do. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, are there any questions? Um, I mean, I know well, you have to be on time, but still, are there other questions? Uh, you just shout them, yeah, I, I would say. Shout. <laughs> yeah, my luggage, uh, KLM lost my luggage, okay? Uh, so as I they thought, do, I as thought, they I do. Thought I'd, I thought I'd lost it, so I was really, really pissed off for a day. Just bought it. In a sale. Oh, really? There was <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, No, is the short answer, because punk, um, London punk was 40 years ago, and it's very much, the music itself is very, very much a product of place and time. Um, so on one level, London punk is in history, it's 40 years ago. But the attitude, I mean, punk, you know, to me, punk was about freedom and rebellion. It took a particular form, and about and the most important thing about it was doing it yourself. You know, don't wait for anybody to give you money or to pat you on the back, do what you're gonna do, and do it. The great thing about punk was that it created a situation whereby the, the, sh the amount of the, sh the distance between having the idea and doing the idea was very, very small. You could have an idea and you could do it. And this would be something that just that climate rather than the actual music, the music is unimportant, the music is in history, it's there. But the actual idea that you can do something as soon as you have the idea is just fantastic. And it's still quite relevant, I think. I hope so. So okay. it's. So they, I would say there is, there is. Also, punk. rock music is dead. Okay, I can't stand rock music now. It's dreadful. I like electronic music. That's interesting to me. You know, that's modern. You know, and R and B, and you know, I like music to sound as though it was made in 2016. I don't like rock music because it all sounds as though it was made in the 20th century. It's just rehashes, and it's boring. Well, it is. <laughs> so is there another? There's one, yeah, at the back.
be smug, you mean? Um, I think, well, this may be a product of being older. If, you get, if you're too happy with what you have when you're young, you might not have the motivation. But I mean, I spent so many years being unhappy when I was young um, that I'm very happy to be a bit happier now. No, I mean, this has only just come to me over the last couple of years. When I was young, I was very, very restless and agitated and unhappy, and I never thought I'd get to do what I wanted to do. But that kind of, you know, various times in my life, I'd been very desperate. Um, and in a way, when I was doing my first proper big book, the punk book, I was really desperate. I'd, uh, I had the start of 1988, I had three different jobs with three different magazines. By the middle of the year, I had none of them. And this is the other thing about being a journalist, being a freelance. You are so subject to your editors and to changes in regime in various organizations. And also, I, if I disagreed with something politically, I would walk out of a, I would walk out of a magazine or walk out of a newspaper. So, um, of course, I think. But I think it's so. Of course, you can become smug if you're super. You know, if you feel so happy with yourself. But I think you also have to have a, a core strength of knowing who you are and being on some basic level content with who you are. And then you can go out into the world, even if you're having financial problems and all that sort of stuff. What I'm talking about is actually, in another way, the strength to be who you are and to take that out into the world. Everybody's quiet now. <laughs> One more? A couple more? Any more? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's bollocks. Yeah, that's complete bollocks. Um, I, I, I disagree. I disagree with that book. I'm not a person that thinks everything is being done. I'm looking for the new. I think that use, using the past is a climate um, and it doesn't necessarily speak, mean that it's retroactive. I adored some, I mean, the, in 1982, when I first heard um, Grandmaster Flash and the Wheels of Steel, I knew that was the future, and it was the most fantastic record I've ever, ever heard. It was a wonderful record. And I was obsessed with all those sampling records, like Double Dean Steinsky, um, the Lessons 1, 2, and 3, which are the founding blocks of the kind of R&B, R &B, and electronic music we have now. And I love that. I love the fact that there are bits of the past, but it's twisted into something futuristic. It's shaped, it's looped into something completely different. Um, and there was stuff from the past going on in, in 1963, you know, the height of pop modernism. The Beatles were covering old songs. I mean, it's just, it's not an argument I have any sympathy with. I like Simon, but I don't agree with that book. I'm interested in what happens next. I think there is futuristic stuff being made. I think people need to make more futuristic stuff because we need to envision a future that is not the kind of neoliberal crap we have now. One last. We need people like you to stay in London. Otherwise, it's just going to be turned over to, turned over to the Chinese and the Russians. Um, I hate what's happened to London. I really, really hate it. And I think it's disgusting that essential workers and young people cannot live near the center of town. And in a way, it's a kind of death for the city. And I know that a lot of young artists um, are from London are moving to Berlin, and I can see why. You know, and, and I can totally understand why. London is... I'm afraid I, I'm a Londoner born and bred, and I, I'm afraid I think London has, has sold its soul. And but uh, people do need to stay, you're right. She well, needs to stay. I mean, yeah, but you Maybe know what? Asking you know a what? Lot. If, you can't, if you can't make it work, you can't make it work. London's a r really, really tough city, I think. I think it's tougher than New York in some ways. And New York is a very, very tough city. So I think you just got to go with how you feel. If I was young, I, particularly with Brexit, I would just be thinking, well, what the fuck? I'm out of here.
um, because we are going to have a right wing, a very right wing government now for at least five years. And they're going to do all sorts of terrible stuff that everybody disagrees with. It's just going to be awful. That's a happy note to end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's fine. But then, but, then every, but then they'll screw everything up and everybody will, get, everybody will hate them and then there'll be something different. Yeah. So there has to be a new political alliance, okay? And That's yeah, more hopeful. Yes. Thanks, John. Thanks for your time. Okay, um, nice to speak to you all. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> thanks for your attention.